dive into the concepts of quantum biology and I'll start with the uh, area of bioelectromagnetic bio fields or bioelectromagnetism which has a long history that, and, and is picking up speed a bit that's related to biophotons I mentioned earlier it doesn't have to be quantum but it can be uh, and uh, the foray into quantum aspects of bioelectromagnetic fields uh, must be credited to Herbert Froelich, who was a very famous physicist in the 60s and 70s, and towards the end of his career, he, uh, he focused on trying to understand um, the synchronization of biological activities using concepts borrowed from solid state physics he was an expert in, and he actually narrowly missed the Nobel Prize in physics, should have been given, but you know how it works, <laughs> wasn't lucky enough. Um, he, he provided early ideas for the mechanisms of superconductivity, which is electron uh, pairing, Cooper pairs, and coupling with Feynman's um, um, lattice vibrations. So, uh, at any rate, uh, let's talk about his contribution to quantum biology, uh, although at that time nobody even used the term quantum biology, but that's what he proposed. He proposed that um, biological systems, cells in particular, are full of dipoles, and these dipoles interact and organize themselves, and the highest concentration of dipoles probably is in the cellular membrane, and they are actually organized um, regularly. So he proposed that these dipole oscillations uh, that are created by energy supply can undergo something called the Bose-Einstein condensation, which is a, a, a quantum uh, effect par excellence. Uh, it's all incidental, it's something really specific, and it requires several conditions. I will show you the conditions in a minute, but uh, before I do that, I want to also mention the name of Ilya Prigozhin, who is picture here on the right hand side. And he actually did get the Nobel Prize in chemistry. Uh, he um, introduced the concept of autocatalytic reactions and nonlinearity in the context of uh, chemistry, biochemistry, and biology uh, that led to the pattern formation establishing of non-trivial um, results from s simple chemical reactions one of which was called the Brussels Letter, because he was in Brussels, Universal Libre de Bruxelles, and uh, so Brussels Letter was the, uh, one of these examples. But coming back to Froelich, Froelich um, was, uh, uh, well, was obsessed with this idea of how cells uh, interact with, that, with other cells, recognize other cells, and pos possibly create synchronized uh, activities, um, either metabolic or otherwise, um, function together in concert, which we still don't really know how that works. Uh, it cannot be done by diffusion or some mechanical uh, slow process. It has to be fast enough. And, and obviously electromagnetic and especially quantum electromagnetic uh, processes could lead to that. Um, um, and in order to achieve what he proposed, that is this condensation of dynamical dipolar oscillations into a single um, collective state, as it's called, uh, so that's a microscopically manifested state at the level of cells and the groupings of cells, uh, three criteria must be satisfied. The first one is actually pumping, the air, uh, pumping energy into the, these modes, uh, and obviously uh, living systems um, survive by metabolic energy um, production and and distribution, and that would be, of course, uh, the condition that could be satisfied provided it's at a sufficient rate. Uh, I will not go into details because uh, what what it is, how much it is, you know, we have to get into the nitty gritty of the mathematical formulation. But there are many many papers in the literature. You can search for these papers and find conditions. And there was a special um, model called the Wu-Austin Hamiltonian that was solved and, and, and 
strict criteria uh, obtained for the coupling coefficient and the pumping rates. The second is the thermal noise. So this is kind of paradoxical. I told you earlier that temperature is the enemy of quantum effects. Here it's the opposite. The thermal agitation allows the dynamic modes to arise to begin with, and then they need to be coupled uh, and pumped. So, so thermal uh, energy is a condition for the emergence of this the dynamical order, not the opposite, not the condition for destruction of the order. Statically, we might expect this type of thing, but dynamically, no. And there are some other examples where temperature, sufficient temperature is, re is needed for things to occur, enzymatic reactions and so on. So that, that, that is trivially, uh, or, or maybe uh, automatically satisfied, I should say. And the last one is a bit more complicated. It requires nonlinear interactions uh, between, the, uh, between the modes, uh, bipolar modes called free degrees of freedom. And, and that is tricky. So again, a st strong enough coupling, uh, uh, rapid enough pumping, and then thermal noise to, to allow for the distribution of all these um, dynamical uh, um, modes throughout the system. So he predicted that these collective oscillations uh, would occur in the, roughly speaking, low terahertz range, 10 to the 12, which now we know is actually quite um, important because water molecules absorb strongly in this range. So biological systems would be uh, susceptible to such uh, oscillations. Uh, although I have to say that uh, straightforward uh, determination of this frolic kind of condensation has not been achieved, but uh, hundreds of papers in the literature can be found, people trying experimentally, and a lot of theoretical considerations were made. I have to say right now that in spite of this um, not, happen, uh, not having happened yet, um, in spite of 50 years of, of work on it by various groups, um, I believe that one thing that was missed uh, in, in this whole literature is, is the uh, possibility of such dynamical modes occurring in neuronal axons, uh, where you have really regular and long uh, stretches of dipole uh, uh, phospholipid head groups of, mem uh, of, of uh, membrane uh, with dipole moments that can be coupled and furthermore they are pumped continuously as for as long as we are conscious uh, due to action potential. So this is in my opinion the most uh, logical place to look for things and has not been done which is mind-boggling uh, in spite of you know hundreds of papers and tens and, uh, and maybe dozens of researchers. Anyway, uh, the the uh, bottom line is that if that's uh, if that's uh, satisfied and, and things work this way, then um, there would be a, a they call it a giant dipole moment, dynamical oscillating dipole moment, and pro probably characteristic of every cell type. So with different cell types would have different uh, frequencies of these oscillations, high frequency oscillations of dipoles, and could attract each other. Uh, um, and recognize other cells. So there was a lot of work on cell-cell recognition um, as well as uh, synchronization of, of cellular activities. Um, I, many years ago, uh, I wrote some papers on, on this topic with collaborators from physiology and biophysics who uh, we tried to explain the formation of RULO, red blood cells, into stacking up, you know, and, and, and and we concluded that this is a possible explanation, but there was also a, 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 an alternative, which is more classical, uh, average dipole dipole interaction. So it wasn't conclusive, uh, but it wasn't exclusive uh, either. Uh, so that leads me to the question of intelligent cell, which possibly is the proto intelligence, proto consciousness, uh, that um, that kind of is related to what what I just said because. It has to be um, based on some kind of um, self-non-self um, process, recognition process. And Peter Albert Bueller, who, who, who is, uh, uh, I don't know if he's still active in the field, but he was at the University, Northwestern University. And it's uh, Evansville, I believe, not Chicago, really, a suburb of Chicago. Right? Um, 
So, uh, so he spent about two decades, two and a half decades of his career uh, studying uh, the concept of inherent intelligence of a single cell, and he published some uh, papers in very good journals, PNAS and so on, so I believe, where, where he showed um, that cells, uh, individual cells, uh, under controlled conditions, um, attract each other, and he created physical barriers, so no chemicals were released, uh, um, not, uh, were not allowed to um, basically use it, to be used as communication, signaling molecules, no physical, no chemical, so everything was ruled out except for electromagnetic uh, communication between cells. And he actually then, uh, he showed that uh, they were still attracted in spite of these barriers to touching to mechanical or chemical or, um, or some other such means, short range interactions. Uh, and then he went on to simulate the presence of a cell with a bead and he scattered light of different frequencies. And he uh, uh, determined that cells recognize light. And so there's this phototaxis mechanism which peaks at about 800 to 900 nanometer wavelength, which is near infrared. It's almost visible, but not quite. And, and that he called that the cell a manifestation of cell intelligence. You can look up uh, on, on the internet, and he actually claimed uh, that centrioles, which is shown here, the centrioles are tiny organelles in all eukaryotic cells, which um, are composed of nine triplets of microtubules with a, a central doublet of microtubules. They, they are organized uh, in a very uh, geometrical fashion, and these triplets um, act or they, they're movable, they are slightly bent, and they act almost like, like Venetian blinds. He came up with a whole engineering explanation of how light rays can be re uh, received by these Venetian blinds, triplets of microtubules and centrioles. And by the way, centrioles, sorry, centrosomes are composed of two perpendicular centrioles. So, so the cell is able to recognize direction in both the plane and out of plane directions. To, according to him, to within maybe three to five degrees. Um, so very precise orientational um, um, detection of light can be achieved this way. And if you want to uh, learn more about it, I encourage you to visit this uh, website, just Google cell intelligence. So the first aspect is how you detect, um, how the cells detect light, and, and he, he claims that centrioles do that. Um, and, and secondly, how do cells emit light? And that's even probably more interesting uh, because where where would, that's you know related to biophotons I mentioned earlier, also related to probably everything kind of ties together. And uh, Gitter Bluer Bueller further um, hypothesized that the light emission uh, is due to metabolic activity, basically mitochondrial. Um, charge transfer, especially proton, uh, proton uh, transfer across the inner mit mitochondrial membrane through cytochrome C oxidase, which then can, um, changing the energy states can lead to the emission of photons in this uh, range. Anyway, that's still um, hypothetical. I don't think anybody has experimentally determined that that's the case. But it leads us uh, to metabolism, which we'll come back to in a few minutes, because metabolism is also um, identified as one of the uh, characteristic features of quantum biological systems. Uh, before I do that, however, I, I, I will make a foray into um, cell-cell communication, uh, or continue with this theme, to something more recent. Uh, in fact, a few years ago, I came across this uh, a fact which is actually well known in, in cancer cell biology, which is called the bystander effect. And the bystander effect is, is basically um, a situation whereby um, damage to cells due to chemotherapeutic agents or radiation uh, is perceived by neighboring cells, but not damaged. So cells somehow communicate that they are under attack. 
and you can measure the respon response of other cells by elevation of heat shock proteins or, or some, some other enzymes. And, and so that's, that's well known, but what's, uh, what's not so well known is, is uh, how it actually happens. And this could be quite distal. And the bystander effect is also known out, um, at a, a higher level of organization, not just cells in the culture, let's say, but, uh, but also by entire organisms. And this uh, is uh, another interesting um, observation published in pretty reputable journals by, by Professor Carmen Mothersill, who is a radiation biology professor at McMaster University here in Canada. And, and I contacted her and read the papers, which are quite amazing. Uh, they done experiments with schools of fish divided in an aquarium into two groups. One group was uh, exposed to um, radiation, the other not. And those fish, uh, fish, fishes that were not exposed also somehow um, reacted the same way as those that were exposed. So there's some um, hitherto unexplained uh, effect. If it's electromagnetic communication, uh, that would be one possibility. But there's even more bizarre reports uh, published by this group where, uh, where organisms like these schools of fish reacted to, to the exposure before it happened. In, in fact, this is really bizarre and, and some sort of precognition uh, that might be, you know, in quantum mechanics, strange things happen. One of which that I, I will mention in this connection may not be an explanation, but it's definitely the only place I can look for a physical explanation is in, in relativistic quantum mechanics, which would apply to photons. Um, there are solutions which are forward in time and backward in time. <laughs> so solutions of the Dirac equation, which is the uh, application of the Schrodinger equation to relativistic cases, relativistic quantum mechanics, you can, you can have solutions propagating in both directions in time. So if that's uh, an example of biological or relativistic quantum mechanics, then maybe it explains it. I'm not saying it does, but it's tantalizing to speculate. Uh, and of course, that also leads to the question of how you scale up these things from, science, from cells to organisms, how these effects um, are uh, biologically uh, amplified and and I think that really this amplification aspect for me is one of the most interesting um, um, unanswered questions largely uh, for all of human physiology how do we amplify uh, the perception of uh, visual perception from uh, rods and cones in the retina detecting a single photon to the Whole brain understanding that there is light coming <laughs> to me. How do we amplify tac uh, tactile uh, signals or or tiny um, um, aromatic molecules in the air, especially you know dogs and very sensitive uh, species like that? So that's uh, these are the open questions. These are the papers that any, if anybody is interested in this um, bystander effect. Uh, so you see here 2018, 2012, last decade or so, the group of Karma Mothersill from, um, I think they were, prior to moving to McMaster, they were in Dublin, Ireland, if I remember correctly, but anyway, there, there you go. Uh, so, as I mentioned before, life, uh, one of the hallmarks of living systems is metabolic energy production and transduction, which applies to both plants and animals for plants, light, energy, and of course, nutrients in the soil and all that. Uh, I don't want to be, I'm a physicist, I like simple things, I don't want to complicate, uh, the, so the bottom line, light uh, photons provide the, the main source of energy for plants. Um, glucose is the main source of energy for animal cells or molecules like glucose, and, and then in turn, um, these, uh, at the cellular level, uh, these organisms transform this 
um, either electromagnetic energy or biochemical energy to digestible units, the, the quanta of energy, ATP molecules. And if you want to remember uh, a, a number, a biological energy quantum is 10 to the minus 20 of joule. Easy to remember, 10 to 20 with a minus sign. Uh, that's roughly the, I think it's five times for ATP. But for GTP, it could be about one. Uh, that's, that's the amount of energy that uh, individual steps in each mm, significant uh, process that is not left to chance, like diffusion, requires. Uh, so a quantum of biological energy is used. So the neglected player so far, is, is, I mentioned only briefly, is mitochondria, plural of mitochondria. And, and that leads to the topic of quantum metabolism, which although is not so prominently found in the quantum biology literature, to my opinion is actually quite significant because, uh, because it's, um, again, uh, in parallel with the development of quantum mechanics, you can trace such um, uh, conceptual advances in quantum biology. So we mentioned photosynthesis being, in, in, being similar or analogous to photoelectric, photoelectric effect in physics. Um, so light causing a, an energy transformation in a substrate is either you know, metallic electrodes for photoelectric effect uh, or um, or chlorophyll in leaves for the photosynthetic effect. The other uh, second, uh, maybe uh, in importance, quantum effect in physics was uh, the Debye the theory of solids, specific heat of solids, which indicated that not just particles, individual particles like electrons and protons, uh, are engaged in quantum interactions, but also virtually infinite collections of of molecules and atoms can create collected quantum states. And that's why, to me, it's very important for biology to think about this. Um, because um, that has a very long history, actually, going back to some major names in, in chemistry and physics, uh, Laplace and Lavoisier, 1780. Uh, that was the time of the first industrial revolution. So they, uh, they formulated the hypothesis of the respiration breathing and uh, respiration in general, cellular and, and organismic, is a form of combustion, oxygen, you know, and um, burning of some fuel, glucose. And, and so they claim that metabolic rates of organisms can be measured by measuring the amount of heat produced by the organism or conversely oxygen uh, um, consumed and carbon dioxide exhaled. And so that's how we measure actually from metabolic rates these days. Again. And then Rubner, almost, uh, what is it, 125 years later, uh, started the uh, endeavor of correlating body size with metabolic rates and, and, and other things such as lifespan. So energy and time. Um, sorry, not really energy. And the rate of energy transformation which is power. In physics, we typically talk about energy and time. In engineering, it's power, power generation, right? And in biology, it's met metabolic rate, which is power, and not times, not temperature, because temperature is constant, but time. This is the amount of time it takes for each cycle of some chemical biochemical reaction or or some process. So. So then Kleiber, fast forward in France in 1940, uh, systematically studied all these mass um, uh, reams of data on metabolic rates and sizes of organisms. And he came up with a so-called uh, elementary scaling laws of physiology that remain a bit of a mystery for, uh, for more than half a century, actually. What, what they say is the following, W is body size, why is the metabolic rate? So uh, you'll see it in several reincarnations in a few minutes. Basically, it says that the metabolic rates of organism, and actually that applies across the spectrum of living systems from uh, single cell organisms, unicells, to plants, to animals, 
So from a bacterium to a giraffe, uh, you have scaling laws which um, relate the rate of metabolic energy production or consumption to the size. And it's not linear. Uh, you, you would imagine that if an organism is twice as big, it would take twice as much um, nutritional intake for it to survive. No. It scales typically with the exponent of three quarters. Uh, you have here uh, several, uh, at the bottom, several characteristic exponents, but by far the most common is three quarters exponent. For plants, uh, it varies. It can be two thirds or one, and, and for, yeah, for animals, between two thirds and three quarters. So one is seldom the case. So that uh, would be uh, isometry. Isometric scaling laws would be width size. Allometry would be different than one. And by far, allometric scaling laws prevail. Now the question, how can one explain this, is, is, uh, is it's a big one, and people try. Um, one of the explanations in the late 1990s was, became quite famous, actually, this scientist uh, West was one of them. Um, who proposed that it has to do with the fractal nature of the um, delivery systems, cardiovascular system, can, and you know, basically vasculature branching out, and, and the, this limits the transport rates. But as you saw just a moment ago, uh, this would only apply to to. High, higher mam mammalian systems that have this kind of property, the cardiovascular systems like that. Of course, bacteria have no cardiovascular systems, unicellular organisms don't, and, and plants certainly don't. So this is not a universal explanation. So uh, instead, um, Lloyd Demetrius pointed to the existence of energy transduction structures across all life forms and enzymatic uh, os oscillating enzymatic reactions. Uh, so this shows you the different um, sites, different organelles that participate in energy transduction from bacterial membranes to chloroplasts in plants to mitochondria in, um, um, in mammals and especially in mitochondria, but in, let's say in plants and some bacteria we know it's photosynthetic, uh, it's quantum. Uh, as I'll come back to before the end of this lecture. Uh, in, it's less obvious, but it's also true that in mitochondrial membranes, we have five protein complexes that participate in uh, various um, stages of the ATP molecule uh, production from ADP through the transfer of um, protons across the membrane. And proton flows across the membrane and coupled to electron transfer electron chain reactions along the membrane. And these electron um, transfer reactions in the membrane are quantum hopping. B basically, the barriers to transfer which are overcome by tunneling. And that's, a, again, one of the examples of at the uh, molecular level or below of the uh, quantum me mechanical uh, process taking place. But it's, there's more to it. So that aspect is quantum mechanical, and if you, if you were to, to basically look at electrons as classical charge, charge is moving up, um, along the protein, they would never make it. So there, you couldn't couple electron states to the um, production of ATP molecules. All right, so let's just skip that. Uh, so this model or theory of quantum metabolism is, is uh, as proposed by Lloyd Demetrius is, is based on that um, um, assertion as well as it stands on the shoulder of giants such as um, Mitchell who got a Nobel Prize for, in biochemistry for identifying the chemiosmotic process uh, involved in the um, mitochondrial ATP production due to the proton gradient between the uh, ATP, sorry, between the um, uh, mitochondrial interior and the cytoplasmic pH. So you have to have a gradient, and that gradient, when it's abolished, stops the reaction from happening. 
All right, so this, this is where these um, uh, quantum tunneling processes occur. You can see here, it starts with AD, NADH molecule giving electrons uh, and then becoming um, positively charged, and a proton is released, and then you have, uh, in the first complex on the left, protein complex one, and then these electrons are gradually transferred to protein complex two and three and four, all of this involves hopping, and, and then you have in, pro, uh, in complex four, you have the um, two protons being pumped across the membrane and three, four, etc. Uh, the net result is uh, a proton flow uh, into the um, um, inner intermembrane space where ADP molecules are um, phosphorylated with the third phosphate group and, and and then it creates the high energy ATP molecule, which is then pumped out uh, in the ATP ACE um, uh, and through the ATP ACE uh, enzyme uh, F0 at the end. Uh, and as you can see here, the transfer of ADP into ATP. It, that's another interesting machinery of the cell, um, deserving separate attention, but I'm here to talk about quantum metabolism. So we just take it as a given. So Mitchell uh, couple showed that uh, coupling of the flow of high energy electrons from NADH to low energy electrons um, across the um, uh, mitochondrial membrane uh, coupled to the um, ATP, uh, uh, sorry, the attachment of the phosphate to ADP and production of ADP. Uh, results in the uh, so in the uh, metabolic work being done. So uh, now, where is quantum now? I told you that the electrons, found it, but there's more to it. Uh, quantization in the form of ATP, individual quanta of biochemical energy, but there's more to it. There's also synchronization. These enzymes. Um, um, ATP ACEs, these are rotatable machines, uh, motors, they are synchronized uh, oscillators. So you have oscillations of these that are coupled, and coupling between these oscillations is at the uh, core of the concept of quantum metabolism. So first chemiosmotic coupling, Mitchell, Nobel 1970. Um, energy storage in the form of dipole oscillation following 68, and then the use of energy quantization following the by in 1912. So that's, these are the three uh, foundational aspects of quantum metabolism. And then, like the matrix added to it, the uh, synchronization of enzymatic oscillators, because this, these are cyclical processes. So they have to be coupled together to, uh, to lead to uh, overall uh, orchestration of energy production and eventual energy consumption. Uh, so uh, that's the postulate that uh, Lloyd Demetrius made, now it's 20 years ago, in 2003, uh, quantum statistics and analytic scheme laws. So this is the first time, in my opinion, I may be, um, I may be wrong, but um, after Froelich's Bose conversation of dipole oscillation, somebody uh, introduced quantum statistics, which means for many, many uh, copies of the same uh, system, in this case, ATP is in mitochondria, and mitochondria, there's 2,000, 3,000 mitochondria per cell, depending on the cell, thousands of mitochondria, tens and, and, or hundreds of ATP ases, so we are talking about um, large numbers um, uh, of oscillating enzyme, hundreds of thousands maybe, in, uh, in a single cell, and then you have, what, trillions of cells. So imagine all of this coupled together, uh, forming a large system of, um, of coupled subsystems. So this is the quantization rule that, uh, remember, uh, when was it, I think in the first or second lecture, I talked about how Einstein made a mistake and when he uh, tried to explain the specific heats of solids, he assumed that every 
molecule in a solid or atom oscillates randomly, not random, independently of its neighbors, but the bike uh, corrected that and said, no, no, they form waves instead of independent oscillations in random phase um, fa fashion, they are coupled and these oscillations then form waves. Waves can be quantized because there are boundaries and that's exactly what uh, the kind of thinking that Lloyd Demetrius uh, proposed with a little bit of my help, I have to say, because I used the, the physical uh, machinery to actually turn the handle and do the calculation for uh, in deep dimensions, that is one dimensional systems, two dimensional systems, and three dimensional systems of these oscillators. As you can find them in, in uh, you know, more or less on flat surfaces or bulk or linearly distributed. In each case you have a different result, slightly different. And this is kind of the mathematics behind it. I don't want to uh, belabor it. Then you have to do the integration of the of the Debye function and the density of states uh, of these oscillators. Uh, suffice it to say that the, the, uh, the net result is this. There are two possible results depending on, um, on um, the characteristic time over which this process takes place compared, compared to, the, um, to the cycle, to the cycle time of each of the oscillators. So, um, so in the first case, a tau less than tau star is a quantum limit. In the quantum limit, you get the allometric scaling laws exactly uh, as observed in, in biology over the last 250 years. Maybe you don't see it, but I'll tell you why it's so. So P is the metabolic weight, W is the weight of the organism, or the size, and little d is the dimension. So if, if, it, if you talk about uh, a one-dimensional uh, system of oscillate, uh, enzymatic oscillators, d is one, so it scales with one divided by one plus one, which is one half. That's one of the scaling laws, typically found in, let's say, uh, bacteria maybe. And that's one possibility. If D is two, so in a plane, if you have a planar biological system of metabolic oscillators, you can think of all kinds of um, um, organisms which would be suitable for, for this representation, and maybe leaves. D is two, so two divided by two plus one is two thirds. That's another characteristic scaling law, actually used as a shortcut. Um, more often than the actual three quarters, because two thirds is like the ratio of surface to volume, and maybe even I'll ex explain in a minute why it's very useful and important. And the last case is d equals three, so bulk uh, distribution of enzymes, and three divided by three plus one is three quarters. That's the canonical allometric scaling law of physiology. Now. In, in the classical limit, when tau is greater than tau star, it's an iso isometry. So, so th this calculation, and you have to really read the paper, uh, or several papers, to, to get the nitty gritty, but the bottom line is that this, this calculation explains all the major observed scaling laws in, in the uh, living systems. And depending on dimensionality and the characteristic times, you may uh, obtain uh, one or the other. Now, why is it important, uh, and, and that's again uh, shown in, in the uh, full glory the equation with the coefficient, and there is also temperature dependence uh, due to the Arrhenius relation, an exponential function before. The importance of it is not only to understand um, uh, you know, the basic science of um, of quantum metabolism, but also practical. Uh, things like um, how do you properly administer medication, uh, let's say, uh, either extrapolate from animal studies to humans, uh, because that's the scaling. You know? From mouse to a rat, it's a factor of 10. Right? Mice weigh about 20 grams, rats 200, 300, so, so, it, so you, have, you cannot scale it linearly. You'll be making a huge mistake, maybe killing the rat while the mouse would be still happy. 
this from rats to humans, so from 300 grams you go to 70 kilograms, let's say. So now you have to scale appropriately. The, the scaling laws of physiology will tell you to take the ratio of the weights and, and put it to power three quarters, not one. One is overestimating uh, the amount of, um, let's say, medication or nutrition, whatever, uh, nutritional supplements if you want to be gentle. All right, so that's quantum metabolism. Uh, this also leads to, to something which I, uh, I conned the biological Planck constant because it goes back to the proposed relationship that energy is proportional to frequency. As you, as you remember from the first lecture, Planck proposed that the energy, which is any form of energy, in that particular case electromagnetic energy, was proportional to the frequency of electromagnetic radiation. And the co coefficient of proportionality was the Planck constant, which is the universal Planck constant. We did the same thing, it's, it's a longish explanation. Um, putting in the numbers for, let's say, um, a single cell, knowing, roughly speaking, how many mitochondria, how many ATPases, how many ATP molecules, what's the turnover time, a millisecond, and so on. And we obtained something like uh, the, the, this corresponding coefficient k. In this case, frequency is the frequency of, of a biochemical cycle. In, in, in the case of metabolic cycle, it's the one kilohertz, right? Because it's a millisecond is the time it takes to produce one molecule. So it would be one, one kilohertz. And the coefficient kappa would relate frequency to energy of the produced molecule. And it ends up being something like 11 orders of magnitude or 12 orders of magnitude larger than the physical Planck constant. And that makes sense. It's, um, we calculated what it corresponds to. It, it really translates into something like the number of atoms per mitochondrial sphere of influence. If you divide the cell into regions that each mitochondrion um, controls en energetically or provides en energy to, then it makes sense. So that would be kind of uh, our little contribution to bringing physics and biology together. The constant is not the Planck constant that we find in physics, but a much larger one because the systems are much larger over which this sphere of um, influence exists. So. Um, quantum coherence of um, in photosynthesis. So this uh, now we switch gears and go into uh, quickly into the uh, what is called the the most well defined or developed aspect of quantum biology, namely photosynthesis. I kept talking about it. Now we can look at what, what's happening really, and that goes back to the um, to the year two thousand seven. Uh, Engel's paper on quantum be beating, so basically looking at chlorophyll uh, isolating uh, fMR systems, which you'll see in a minute, from chlorophyll and, and shining laser light and observing the response and finding evidence for quantum coherence through something like quantum beats. So it, it's a collective state which is uh, a in a superposition of two frequencies close together, and that was measured very precisely. Um, so let's start with what photosynthesis is and, and isn't. So it's an extremely efficient uh, system in terms of energy absorption from the ambient light, um, mastered by nature over billions of years of evolution. And um, it involves um, production of high energy electrons, uh, first absorption of quanta of light photons, exciting these uh, molecular systems and causing electronic en energy flows, which are then used for um, downstream effects like glucose uh, production. Now, so it's kind of similar in, in the basic steps to mitochondrial metabolism, except using light energy as the primary motor of it. In mitochondria, remember we needed pH gradients to 
to drive things across the membrane. Um, it's, it's not actually limited to plants photosynthesis, also some bacteria and algae use photosynthesis. And this is C. tepidum, it's a um, bacterial chlorophyll system in the very hostile um, hot spring <laughs> environments in New Zealand. And, and that's sort of the complex geometry of the system which absorbs light, as you can see here, and uh, through a cascade of um, transformations eventually uh, excites this complex, uh, molecular complex of seven identical um, um, polycyclic, um, multicyclic molecules uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, in reasonable close proximity, and as as, as has been demonstrated in the literature, uh, exciting one of them excites all of them. So it's the wave function of the seven molecules that is collectively produced by by electromagnetic energy uh, excitation, and and these. So this is just the seven molecules uh, shown here uh, for the complex. And if you excite uh, one, kind of it gets distributed, the wave function is, is collectively produced. These are the geometrical um, dimensions and, uh, and interaction coefficients you can find in the literature, which were used to construct the so-called Hamiltonian function. Uh, the energy mm, function for the system and solve. Um, so there was both experiment and theory behind it. And uh, importantly, these excitations uh, have a, um, a lifetime of um, hundreds of picoseconds, if I remember correctly, up to maybe a nanosecond. So very short by our standards, but long enough to be useful and collected and then uh, to give rise to electronic tra transformations and downstream um, effects. Uh, so this is a, an algae, single cell algae, which is a light harvesting system using the same, the same uh, me mechanism. And that leads to this quantum entanglement. So talking about, remember we talked about what is the definition of quantum biology, exotic effects, not necessarily trivial chemistry, but a quantum entanglement. And this entanglement has been shown to exist for, as I mentioned, picoseconds, hundreds of picoseconds perhaps at best, at room temperature. So one of the objections to quantum effects is overcome here. And quantum beating was demonstrated uh, that, um, that uh, is evidence that these of another mm. uh, hallmark of quantum physics, superposition of two states, and they interact, uh, and giving rise to the quantum beats. And beats of waves are just like, you know, you're out of tune on the radio dial, and you have superposition of two waves with a very similar frequency, but not quite right on. And then you can see these ups and downs um, in the intensity of sound. Now, let's, uh, let's uh, in the last um, half an hour or so of this lecture series, turn our attention to something more, more exotic and unexplored or on the frontier, uh, namely consciousness, uh, our brain function, uh, which we all um, perform and we actually have difficulty understanding how we do it. So, uh, and at the center of this um, topic, uh, you'll find microtubules, although microtubules play ma major roles in other biological contexts, cell division in particular, you can see here in mitotic cells. But I'll be mostly interested in the microtubule cytoskeleton and neurons. This is on the right, you see uh, on the left, and schematically on the right, kind of magnified a neuron with the uh, nucleus inside the, um, uh, in the center, and then you have the thick bars, our microtubules, bundles of microtubules connected by thin lines, which are microtubule-associated proteins. 
so it forms a, a very organized structure. We know that they perform uh, a lot of functions, one of which is transport, transporting the material to the synapse, for example. Um, and, but they are suspected of doing much more than that, and we'll come to it shortly. Um, I want to um, acknowledge uh, the um, visionary work of Stuart Hameroff, going back to the 1970s, like half a century. He, he wrote uh, an amazing book still, uh, captivating today, called Ultimate Computing in 1987, I believe it was published uh, way before we even talked about quantum computing. But um, anyway, focus on uh, microtubules, and they are involved in, um, or at least correlated with almost all uh, neurodegenerative diseases. The damage to the microtubule cytoskeleton is implicated in Alzheimer's, for example, like tau, tauopathies, you know, and disconnection of microtubules, the deterioration of neurons, and so on. Uh, that's a separate topic for another series of lectures. But, and then bipolar disorder, dementia, schizophrenia, all of it have one thing in common, namely uh, cytoskeleton, um, impairment of the cytoskeleton. And, and, and so what I want to show you, we just talked about photosynthesis, FMO system, the seven um, multi-ring molecules that share the quantum excitations. When you look at microtubules, the building blocks of microtubules are tubulin dimers, beta and alpha, shown here at the top. And uh, many years ago, we demonstrated that um, these dimers have, uh, each dimer has eight tryptophan molecules, which are similar to those in the FMO complex. They have uh, uh, indole rings, uh, also uh, present in many um, uh, psychoactive compounds, which is interesting. Right? So things like, um, um, like uh, serotonin and um, and uh, heroin and codeine and so on. You you find the same in the rings. But be it as it may, what I want to show you is that the geometrical distribution of these tryptophans um, and and tryptophans, by the way, can be excited um, in the near ultraviolet range of electromagnetic waves. So electronically, music can be excited, and therefore. There could be some play uh, in terms of um, electromagnetic quanta generating electronic processes, maybe quantum states in tubulin. That's that's the working hypothesis. We published some papers on actually com computing this, predicting what will happen. This is the uh, tryptophan molecule has a 5.5 divide dipole moment. You can couple them; they are close enough. We published papers on the dynamics of these couplings. So before experiments were made, we predicted that there will be hundreds of picoseconds, perhaps, of, uh, of quantum excitations created in, in tubulin, of microtubules, and maybe even longer if you allow for more interactions, because you have many dipole moments of different dimers. So that was theoretical, purely speculative. And and two years ago, we received funding from the Templeton Foundation to carry out experiments to demonstrate whether this is true or not. And with the help of um, several, uh, actually two groups, um, uh, we performed two sets of experiments. The first one at the University of Central Florida uh, in, in, the, uh, in, in the group of Professor Dogayu. Uh, involved uh, luminescence. So this, here we uh, compared the um, uh, fate of microtubules exposed to laser light in the visible range, different wavelengths, but visible, which would kind of exclude, uh, by definition, these tryptophans. So maybe there's some other, the question is, what, are there any other possibilities than tryptophan ultraviolet excitations? Why is that? Because ultraviolet is not so easily um, uh, harnessed by biological systems. It's actually dangerous, as you know, UV light damages, damages DNA, so that would be, but visible light not so much. So, 
So this was the setup of the experiment. Illumination for two minutes, then I believe it's four minutes of waiting time, then illumination, and, and so on. Re repeated over five cycles you know, with this equipment, laser light in a very specific con configuration, power, uh, intensity, electric field, reasonably low, 186 volts per meter, it's not a lot. Imagine, compare it to the transmembrane potential, which is 10 million volts per meter. This is less than 200. So not really damaging to the biological structure. And then measurement of the re-emitted light from the systems. We looked at tubulin in solution, then microtubules in solution, and then microtubules and tubulin with anesthetic molecules. And the, the reason for anesthetic molecules inclusion in it would be to, to answer the question, do anesthetics change any of that? And if they do, then we probably have some mechanisms of anesthesia, one of possible mechanisms. We still don't know how anesthesia works at the molecular level. And, and, and then you observe these um, uh, emission spectra I of T is the intensity of emitted light as a function of temperature. And um, we haven't published um, much of it yet, but I can tell you that um, in these experiments, there was a very rapid re-emission of most of the photons from the system over, let's say, picoseconds to nanoseconds, and then very slow re-emission of the remaining energy over hundreds of milliseconds, which is first of all incredibly attractive because it could explain some um, um, more exotic functions of microtubules that could be used as uh, photonic waveguides of some kind or maybe electromagnetic energy storage, de storage device or cell-cell communication devices. We talked about Albert Gulak's experiment, that, that could be part of it. And, and the second thing is, so nano, uh, hundreds of milliseconds of delayed luminescence, which is a long enough time for any physiological work to be done. The second thing is the effects of anesthetics. They were um, measurable. Uh, they reduced this, uh, the, the time, uh, delayed luminescence time by maybe 20-25%, so it wasn't dramatic, but it was in the right direction. Um, however, we used also negative control in molecule pyrotoxin, which is not uh, an anesthetic molecule, it's, I believe it's um, anticonvulsant, um, and it had the same effect, so unfortunately it wasn't so clear cut. Uh, all right, and, and um, yeah, so these are the experiments which we are still um, writing up the um, papers uh, and to, to report the findings. Um, I don't know if I have... <coughs> I will now maybe talk about the second experiment which was done at Princeton. And uh, at Princeton we used ultraviolet excited tryptophans as I mentioned to you. Um, and we obtained much shorter uh, re-emission times about up to five nanoseconds, but still longer than those of photosynthetic systems. So that's really great. Uh, what was not so great, we used a very um, sophisticated way of measuring the distance over which these quantum states exist in tubulin, the microtubules, and they were about five nanometers to six nanometers or so, which means a single dimer would, could be in a quantum state, but not the entire microtubule. Why am I saying this? Because if if any of you watching here are familiar with the hammer of Penrose hypothesis, they claim that microtubules become, uh, become quantum um, structures uh, globally. So the entire microtubule will be in a quantum state, and perhaps two microtubules could even, uh, or more, could even create a, a, a larger quantum state. And what we found is actually only a tubule and dimer, a single dimer could be uh, seen to be spatially coherent. And we also use anesthetics. That was done at the lab of Professor Scholes at Princeton. Greg Scholes was one of the uh, sort of founding, uh, founding not members, but uh, pioneers in the field of quantum biology working 
on photosynthesis are highly credible. Um, all right, so so we are kind of stuck at this level of gray zone. <laughs> we know that quantum effects exist in tubulin and microtubules, but we know that they are probably fairly localized. How do we connect uh, the local locally quantum states into a larger global state? We don't quite know yet. Uh, we also know that anesthetics quench these states somewhat, but not only anesthetics. Uh, as you know, um, um, well, if, if you thought about anesthesia, there are many different ways of creating uh, uh, an anesthetic state, one of which is even to, to be hit with a hammer over your head, right? <laughs> you lose consciousness in no time. So this is kind of a joke, but um, what I'm saying is that my, microtubules may be involved in, uh, in the creation of anesthetic conditions, but may not be necessary for it. Could be that there could be some other mechanisms, and perhaps different anesthetic molecules do it differently. One of which is xenon; it's a single atom which is an anesthetic, and we have no clue how xenon can cause anesthesia. Um, so that leads us to some of the key questions about consciousness and and, and our brain. Uh, what makes the brain special as an organ? Uh, what is consciousness? Some people even claim that. Consciousness is beyond the brain. That maybe there there are some conscious states of um, or memory even stored in in um, individual cells outside of the brain. The brain. So where is memory stored? What is the computational power of the brain? How is information encoded? And how how is how is it that the brain is such an incredibly uh, powerful and highly efficient uh, computational device, quote unquote. Um, I, I bring this quote from Robert Epstein, posted about seven years ago, your brain is not a computer. Yes, we know it's not a computer, but we know for sure it, per, uh, it performs computations. I can demonstrate in a minute that I can compute things, even solve partial differential equations. So if it's not computation, what is it? And of course, this I don't know if it's a joke or not, but uh, if it's a joke, then it's not so funny. <laughs> we can't find Beethoven's Fifth Symphony in our brain, of course not, or Shakespeare's poems, uh, or um, um, plays. So, so, but what is uh, sorry? But what is important about human brain is this: that it, it is in one of the most complex structures in the entire universe, and works as one. And so, with hundred billion neurons, and each of which is connected to about 10,000 other neurons on average. So it has about 10 to the 15th synaptic connections. That's an enormous number. Uh, that, conservatively speaking, operated about 100 millisecond time scale, so 10 impulses per second. You end up with about the, um, operational uh, capabilities of each brain of about 10 to the 16th operations per second which is incredible because the, until recently, I don't know if it's still true, the most powerful supercomputer, the blue gene that, for example, was used for playing the game of chess, beating Kasparov and so on, had two times, so 10 times fewer operations per second than, than this would indicate our brains can have. I'm not saying that we, all, we use all of these numbers, some of us use very, very few neurons, <laughs> But some of us uh, beat that number even uh, handily. Uh, I don't even want to mention Einstein, but there's a lot of human genius in various fields, spheres of competence. So, so okay, that's one thing. We, we do have at least um, numerically comparable um, computational power to that of supercomputers. First of all, in a very small space, uh, what is one and a half kilograms, of, of um, mass, but the most rem remarkable thing is that the blue gene requires 1.5 megawatts, so it's 1.5 million watts of power, which is equivalent to the power supply of a small town, maybe a deer or something like that, whereas our human brain uses about 25 watts, which is less than the uh, power demand on the, uh, uh, on the bulb of your uh, 
um, of your um, night table lamp. Uh, it's tiny. That's a tiny amount comparable to a flashlight, let's say. And, and, and we power all these. And by the way, 90% of that number goes into maintaining uh, constant temperature, providing all the building, repairing things, you know, just uh, mundane function, <laughs> structural maintenance. Um, maybe about 10% of it, maybe maybe 15, I don't know exactly, but the fraction is used for cognitive function. So if you if you play chess at the high level, perhaps you need more, but not not substantial amount of power. Uh, so now the question is: Is quantum mechanics relevant to the brain? And that goes to the issues of um, non-algorithmic functioning of our conscious activities. Uh, Roger Penrose's books, um, uh, um, The Emperor's New Mind, and, and uh, forget the title of the second book, but very popular uh, and opened the floodgates of discussions about it. Penrose, uh, Nobel Prize in Physics 2020, argues forcefully that the human brain must operate algorithmically. The way we know it for now, it is quantum mechanically because there's no other sort of candidate for non-algorithmic functioning of, of these structures. So is brain a quantum computer? Kind of, but very powerful. Uh, may, and he actually, with Hammerov, go further than that. They say that, that the collapse of the quantum wave function of, of the human brain, or part of it, corresponds to something like a, a thought process, realized thought. And you, before you realize a particular thought, you may have a superposition of ideas floating around, quote unquote. But then, when you say, "Okay, this is it. I want, um, I want uh, uh, sushi for dinner," <laughs> then th that has crystallized. That means the wave wave function has collapsed. That's a measurement problem. Or I want to close this uh, lecture in ten minutes. That's a thought. Or you verbalize something. I don't know if you feel. I mean, this is more psychology uh, than, than science that before you say something or write something down, I have a feeling of still having several thoughts at the same time. Once you say it, it it's that uh, realized thought which is like a measurement problem. Now, now I know it. Before I say it, before I write it, it's still nebulous, it's a little bit fuzzy. Um, now, the third question is kind of philosophical. Because if it's quantum, then uh, then it opens a lot of uh, intriguing ideas. Uh, because remember the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, uh, providing an, um, a sharp limit on on knowability of any system, a single electron, let alone the brain. But if we have uh, wave functions, quantum mechanical wave functions constructed in neurons, then they obey quantum mechanics and therefore are subject to the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. And, and by extension, our, our minds are, strictly speaking, unknowable and unpredictable. And if that's so, then what about AI? As of today, artificial intelligence boasts of being able to beat us, you know, uh, humans or replace humans in intellectual uh, activities, but, but that gives us um, actually a way out, because if we think quantum mechanically, we cannot be predictable, and AI al algorithms are based on pattern recognition, and that would say, no, that's predictable. So I see here a contradiction, uh, at least um, a, a, a problem for AI to solve. If, if AI is supposed to replace, uh, let's say, creative activities, painting, music, etc., etc. Um, yeah, and implications for artificial intelligence. And, and the second implication is for free will. There is this uh, evolutionary biologist, Professor Sapolsky from Stanford, I believe. He forcefully claims that we don't have free will, that everything that we do is somehow predetermined by the conditions. But if, it, if we operate, if our brain operates quantum mechanically, that's not so. I mean, there may be gen general constraints, but in the end, uh, quantum mechanics gives us a way out of it, and free will uh, is saved. So, so these are very interesting philosophical repercussions. This, this diagram shows you 
how the um, duo of um, anesthesiologist Stuart Hameroff and physicist mathematician Roger Penrose uh, perceived the uh, origin of quantum consciousness, starting with these protein qubits, um, which we now know they exist uh, from these experiments done in Princeton and in Florida, that individual turbulence exist in quantum state. Well, support quantum states. They also have a classical framework, but, but there is a quantum state on top of a classical state. So some degrees of freedom may be quantum, such as tryptophan, um, and maybe some other electronic degrees of freedom. And, and some other could be just simply classical. But they, they then claim that these quantum states interact and form a, a very um, potentially humongous a global quantum state of the microtubule. We don't see that yet, but maybe we don't have the tools to, to see it properly. And then through um, synaptic connections, you can um, extend it to other, micro, other neurons. By the way, the, in the 1990s, um, the, there were some papers published by John Eccles, Sir John Eccles, he got the Nobel Prize in Physiology. He claimed that neurotransmitter release uh, in, in the synaptic um, um, connection process is a quantum event as well. So that could be a link between neurons. Beyond that, uh, it's hard to say. So uh, let me just, um, yeah, where we stand is at the bottom we know more or less how things work. We get less and less um, confident as we build higher and higher level structures. and. The, the challenge is integration at various levels of the structural hierarchy from tubulin to microtubules through connections to other microtubules to neurons to dendrites um, and then to the entire um, area of the brain and then the entire brain collectively <laughs> for me actually uh, some people might say this is an easy problem for me it's actually the most fascinating problem to think about is the integration of senses coming from you know the audiovisual from the visual system audio and tactile smell olfaction into a single unitary sense of the environment right we don't think about it it just happens we know that this classroom gives a given aura there is light there is echo and and so on it all comes together how does it happen i have no idea maybe somebody does but I'd be uh, surprised. Um, so um, let me just finish this um, lecture with some some possibility. The possibilities are almost uh, unlimited. We may think that our brain is so small, uh, and, and therefore, how do we cram all that information into our brains? But if we uh, use um, encoding in terms of tubulin dimers uh, of with various degrees of freedom. I didn't have the time to explore it, but you can find in the literature. Each dimer can have several sta states involving uh, C-termini, so carboxy terminal groups, four states per dimer, electron states, at least four, conformational changes, there's a hinge mo movement driven by GTP hydrolysis, two. If you start multiplying on this and calculating the number of dimers uh, of tubulin in a microtubule, tens of thousands, then by the numbers of microtubules in the neuron, thousands, and then the number of neurons, hundred billion, then you end up with a huge number of bits per brain. Uh, back of the envelope calculation gives you about 10 to the 20th, which is pretty astronomical. And now the question is how fast these bits can switch. So back to the contradiction of this claim that the human brain is not a computer. Yes, it's not, but it can compute. If it was computing, it can do um, very rapid numbers of huge computations. Um, let's say if transitions are on the nan nanosecond time scale, that's possibly up to the 28 flops, um, bits per second. Uh, maybe not that many, because that's really fast. Technologically, if we were to do it, perhaps. But anyway. Uh, I'll leave you with this, uh, the, the, the number is still 
um, very large. So even if we take 10 to the 20th bit per second with some restrictions, uh, that's 10,000 times faster than the blue gene. Um, let me see. Yeah, we are out of time. Exactly. <laughs> so it's a good point at, at which to stop. Yeah. And uh, yeah, uh, I hope that the audience got interested in these topics. So um, let's talk about the book tour for your book. Maybe that's an idea that I have and you don't. But two, two things appeal to me a lot. One is what you said about free will today. Yes. That's, that's new. And I think if you think of satisfying broad audiences, almost everybody's interested. In that, so so it seems to me that's kind of a useful talking point. I can I can elaborate on this, maybe not in the two minutes that we have, okay. but, but definitely, in my opinion, this is a a nail to the coffin of a determinism in our uh, yeah thinking about the free will. Well, that that's that's very very interesting, and what I find other people doing, like. The, the people promoting Claude II, the large language model that, that exists in the U, UK and US, um, they, they talk about um, its quantum aspect. And then the next time they talk about it, they, they don't mention that at all. It's like they can turn it on or off, you know? Well, you know, what, what I try to show today is that I see it as a coexistence of things. There is the classical yeah. aspect, no doubt, and then there is the quantum superstructure yeah. on top of the classical structure, yeah. and that is maybe these uh, tryptophans or other quantum degrees, electronic degrees of freedom, which may do some of the most incredible things, like extrasensory perception, maybe um, uh, creative thinking, uh, you know, autistic findings of uh, solutions to complex operations instantaneously. Yeah. Quantum search algorithms can be is easily implemented in this context. And that kind of uh, lays bare the, the sort of deterministic, uh, you know, mundane approach to, to the human mind. Yeah, very, very interesting. Okay, thank you very thank much. You.